Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Rita Hayworth and Charles Corbin in This Love of Ours. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's Lux Radio Theater presentation comes from the pen of one of the greatest modern playwrights, Luigi Pirandello. It is Universal's current hit, This Love of Ours, the provocative and moving story of a wife snatched from the brink of death to confront a husband who disowned her and a child who disbelieves her. Our stars who undertake to solve these problems are the talented and lovely Rita Hayworth and a new arresting personality, Charles Corvin, who appears tonight in a role that won him wide acclaim and promises a distinguished screen career. In arranging to present tonight's play, I visited Universal Pictures and talked with, among others, the studio's ace designer, Travis Banton. Travis has proved that one doesn't have to be extravagant to be a top-flight gown creator. In searching for material for the wardrobe of this love of ours, Mr. Banton remembered dresses that he had created some years ago for two other Universal Pictures. He sprinted to the wardrobe department and there found the garments. They had only been worn three or four days and had been washed in Lux Flakes after every wearing. He found them in excellent condition and the material as lovely as when it was first used. Well, I'm sure housewives are aware of the economy of using Lux Flakes, but they'll be interested to know that Hollywood Studios, using hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of costumes every year, confirm their judgment. It's time for our curtain and the first act of This Love of Ours, starring Rita Hayworth as Karen and Charles Corvin as Michel Tuzak, with Sue England as Suzette and Joe Kearns as Targell. It's a fine spring morning, and in the busy laboratory which adjoins his luxurious Connecticut home, Dr. Michel Tuzak has given some final instructions. Dr. Tuzak is about to go on a journey. Well, I guess that covers about everything, Andrews. Just be sure to run a daily check on the whole experiment series while I'm gone. You have to go to New York, Doctor? Chicago. Wherever it is, it's a cussed nuisance. You're not a traveling salesman, you're a research scientist. Why can't they come here? A medical convention? 600 doctors. 600, huh? Oh, that's very depressing. Yes. Now, hurry, you said you'd drive me to the station. Did I? Well, all right, I'll drive you to the station. I'll see you in front of the house. Goodbye, Daly Summers. Goodbye, Goodbye doctor. Take care of yourselves yes, and the guinea pigs. Oh, we will, doctor. Good luck. Thank you. Daddy, you'd better hurry. I'm coming, darling. Miss Tucker says you'll miss your train. I've still a few minutes. Or are you anxious to get rid of me? Daddy. Oh, Daddy, don't ever say such a thing. I'm sorry, darling. Well, what shall I bring you from Chicago? Just yourself. Nothing special. You're very special. Thank you. Oh, where's your friend, Teddy? He, he went home. Don't you like to play with him? Not while you're here. It's much nicer just having you to myself. But, darling, the world's full of people. It's full of strange people. Except Uncle Paul. And it's not good for a young lady to live alone. Uncle Paul promised to come for the weekend. Don't you like it this way, Daddy? Just being here with me and Miss Tucker? Of course, dear. But I have my work, and you have your whole life things to learn from others. Other people don't know nearly as much as you. I mentioned that to those doctors in Chicago. And I could never love other people as much as I love you. And her. And her. Daddy, you do have time, don't you? Of course I have time. Her shrine looks so beautiful this morning. The flowers are in bloom. And the way the sunlight comes through the window. Oh, it's beautiful, Dad. Well, where is he, Miss Tucker? Oh, good morning, Dr. Andrews. He's in back somewhere, saying goodbye to Suzette. You know, I'm glad Dr. Tuzak's going away. The change will do him good. Do him good. Yes, new people, different scenery. 
You forget, Dr. Andrews, Dr. Tuzak is still a young man. Young man? He's got everything he wants, hasn't he? Success? A wonderful laboratory? That kid of his? Don't try to fool me with that tone of voice. You're as fond of Suzette as I am. Oh, she's a good little girl, Tucker. But sometimes that child frightens me. Oh, you mean the shrine, the chapel? Yes, it's morbid. Morbid? To want a shrine built? A chapel in the memory of a dead mother? You think that's good? In Suzette's case, yes. She makes it very beautiful. Her mother died when she was only a baby. Suzette simply chooses this way to keep her memory alive. Careful, they're coming. Oh, no, yes, I yes. I won't worry nearly as much, Daddy. I know Mother is looking out for you, too. Did it make you sad? No, darling, no. I got your bags, Doctor, and let's get it over with. Jump in, Suzette. I'm not going to the station. My father and I never say goodbye. Do we, Daddy? No, darling. Now, be a good girl. I'll send your telegram as soon as I get there. I'll write, Daddy. I'll write you every day. And mind, Miss Stucker. I will. Take good care of yourself. Bye, Daddy. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really think oh, of that one that well, I had. must admit, Susak, your theories at the conference this afternoon sounded perfectly plausible. A fine address. Thank you, Dr. Barnes. But I think I could punch some holes into them. Why not punch me full of holes tonight, Dr. Bailey, at my hotel? Susak, we're <laughs> supposed to enjoy ourselves tonight. Recreation is good for doctors, too, you know. I wish I had time. Doctors I... should watch people behave when they're well, too. They'd know more what to do when they're ill. That's a rather difficult <laughs> argument to refute. Well, then, what do you say? The four of us. Dinner and two or three nightclubs. Well, how about the hotel? Oh, I know this sounds back to do Well, this is your nightclub, Dr. Barnes. Now, where's that wonderful artist you were telling us about? A caricaturist. Simply amazing. A fellow named Targell. Ah, there he is. Hmm. He attracts quite an audience. He's a genius. A dozen strokes of his crayon and he's got you for posterity. But if you don't feel like... That girl. Oh, at the piano? Oh, she's part of Targell's act. She plays and keeps him in the mood. Or the audience. I don't know which. Well, what are we standing here for? Let's get closer. Let's see how good this fellow really is. Second, madam. Oh, I feel so silly. Everybody watching me. But madam, you are a model who would have delighted Rubens. No, not the three-decker sandwich Rubens. The Rubens who likes his beauty in a big way. <laughs> now, one more stroke and we're all finished. And here you are. Why? I look as big as an elephant. I've never been so humiliated in my life. Edgar, get me out of here. Anyone else willing to risk humiliation? I'm merely a caricaturist. I... Well, Dr. Barnes. I told you I'd be back with more victims, Targill. Oh, Dr. Tusak, Dr. Helmer, Dr. Bailey. Oh, very great honor, gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Bailey, would you mind sitting down? Who? Who, me? Yes, if you don't mind. Well, I... Well, well, why not? Go ahead. Do your darndest. Thank you. <laughs> you too, gentlemen. Sit down. Something wrong, Florence? Excuse me, Joseph. I'll... I'll be back later. Your... Your pianist. Who is she? Her name is Florence, Dr. Tusak. You're certain... She'll be back? Yes, quite certain. Oh, don't ask so many questions, Tuzak. Don't you see Targell is busy? Michelle, what's wrong? Oh, nothing. Nothing. This will only take a moment, Dr. Bailey. You know, when I was a boy, all good doctors had beards. It was practically a professional badge. In fact, a doctor without one was regarded with some suspicion. <laughs> Nowadays, this tradition... No, don't move, please. That's it. it seems to have vanished like all the other fine traditions of my youth. But I'm glad, sir that you've given me the opportunity to render you immortal, even if evanescently. So with a humble twirl of my crayon, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bailey. Oh, oh, oh. Well, I'll be blessed. Why, it's wonderful. Thank you. Hang it in your office, Bailey, to frighten delinquent patients. <laughs> Targell, won't you join us? Thank you, I'd be happy to. Ladies and gentlemen, a short intermission. Wow. Very good, very good. Dr. Tuzak, you're, you're staring again. Someone you know, someone you... Oh, oh, Florence. Over here, Florence. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, won't you sit down? Thank you. Gentlemen, this is Florence. How do you do? Florence? Don't you like the name? Oh, you're the famous Dr. Tuzak. I saw your picture in the paper. You didn't see our pictures in the newspaper? Well, I'm afraid there was only one that really impressed me. Oh, forgive me, gentlemen. But my disposition tonight could be very much better. Yes, the way you deserted your piano, my dear. But my disposition is no reason why I shouldn't drink to your health, gentlemen. 
Or should I say that to Dr. Oh, that's right. Go right <laughs> Dr. Tuzak. Yes? You've been diagnosing me. Are your findings complete? The way you've been staring at me, I don't know whether to be flattered or frightened. I've been very clumsy. I... I want to talk to you alone. Oh, we no, want no, to be no, in no. on this consultation <laughs> together. You can reach me at the Drake Hotel. What? Really? Is your family with you? No. My daughter is going to school. And your wife? I have no wife. Please, call me at the hotel. <laughs> I still say this consultation is not being conducted along ethical lines. Perhaps it's my <laughs> fault. Uh, Joseph, have you a $5 bill? $5? Why, yes, here. Thank you. Here, Dr. Tuzak. I believe that's the customary fee. Thank you very much. Seeing you has been very enlightening. Good night, gentlemen. Hello. Hello, Dr. Tuzak. Mr. Tiger, what is it? I'm sorry to wake you up, but... It's about Florence? Uh, yes, doctor. She attempted to kill herself half an hour ago. Where is she? Central Hospital. Thank you. I'll be right over. to her room, nurse. I'll be there in a few minutes. She'll be coming out of the anesthesia soon. Yes, doctor. Thank you for your help, Dr. Barnes. Well, we operated and she's still alive. You know, it's almost as although all this was planned. A bullet in her heart and you remove it successfully. Thus far, yes. Proving what you've been telling us at the convention. Except this time, it wasn't a guinea pig you were working with. This is all very strange, Tusek. Is it? Yes. You knew this girl, didn't you? Last night at the cafe, that wasn't the first time you met her. No. All right, you don't want to talk. It's, uh, uh, it's unfortunate we haven't the case history. She's always had a very strong constitution. You saw only the x-ray plates and the fluoroscopy. How do you know that? Because she's my wife. Your wife? Yes, Dr. Barnes. Excuse me, I'd better go to her room. Dr. Tuzak, I, uh, I've been waiting here in the corridor. Tell me, please. Her chances are good, if she wants to live. Oh, oh, thank you. Wait. Why did she do this? You, you don't know? Well, uh, let me know if I can do anything for her. I'll let you know. Goodbye, doctor. She's regaining consciousness, doctor. I'll check the respirations. Opening her eyes. Karina. You. Why did you? Why did you? I wanted to die. I wanted to die. I'll stay with her, nurse. Yes, doctor. What's this? Oh, uh, just a bag with her belongings. Mr. Targell. There's a book here. It's her diary. I, uh, thought perhaps it might throw some light on why she shot herself. Uh, the police may want... There's no need to mention anything about it to the police. You may go. Yes, sir. September 12th, 1933. I'm in Paris at last. The new review opened tonight, and, and they liked me. The show is a hit. Georgie and I received three curtain calls in South We played our 200th performance tonight, and, and something happened I'll never forget. On the way to the dressing room, I tripped and, and sprained my ankle. Of course, I'm, I'm out of the show, but... What do I care? A young French doctor was called in. His name is Michel Tuzac. Oh, very reserved and professional, but so good-looking and charming. <laughs> I'm sure my ankle is going to take weeks. But... November 11th, 1934. Tomorrow, just 14 months after our meeting, Michelle and I are going to be married. 
And after the ceremony, the whole cast is coming to our new apartment for a wedding party. And I'm happier than I've ever dreamed. Goodbye, goodbye. <laughs> All I can say, it's time you left. Oh, darling, I thought they'd never go. Oh, but I like your friends, dear. Georgie, too? What about Georgie? Oh, darling, you are jealous, aren't you? I'm in no mood to be serious. But you are. Well, this much I will say. The prospect of your never seeing him again affords me considerable relief. <laughs> affords you considerable relief. Oh, darling, I love the words you use. I learned English from a very pedantic teacher. And, and what about the others? Bruce and Johnny Carter and Mark? Oh, will and... you miss them, darling? Michelle. I can't have but be jealous, darling. But you promised me. You're too beautiful. I love you, Michelle. Oh, don't you see? Georgie and the others, they're only... May I come in? Thank you very oh, much. Georgie. I forgot to give you something. Rabbit's foot. Thank you. For luck. I can't get it through my head. No, I can't. Look at her, Michelle. Yes? She's a very superior person. No one knows that better than I. That's where you're wrong. I know it. Oh, Georgie, please. Now, let me finish. You see, I don't approve of this marriage at all. Well, I thought you wished me luck. You, the wife of a member of the Paris Hospital. Do you know what you've said goodbye to? From now on, it'll be tea parties, not champagne. Your whole life is dull and colorless as a cup of weak tea. Get out. In a moment. Or do I upset you too, Michelle? You may be telling her the truth, you know. I've tried to warn Karin too, but she wouldn't listen. How could she? You don't even speak her language. Oh, George. What about clothes, Karen? You've always loved beautiful, expensive clothes. Would you like nice conservative dresses, neck up to here, shoes with low heels? And, oh, don't forget to play up to the president's wife. She really runs the hospital, you know. Laugh at her jokes, admire her hats, listen to her servant You problems. seem to know a lot about it. Don't I? But I never thought I'd see you as one of them. Well, Michelle, I'm waiting. Knock me down and throw me out. You're drunk. Yes. Well, goodbye, my pet. I'm going to miss you. Oh. Oh, darling, please. He didn't mean what he said. That's, that's just Georgie. You, you've known him for a long time. Oh, we've done four shows together. Karin, tell me. Michelle, he's never been anything to me but a dancing partner. None of them have been anything to me. Oh, darling, I do so want to be a good wife to you. You will, Karin, because you love me. If you only knew how much, darling. You only knew. June the 5th, 1936. Two weeks ago, our first child was born. Michelle is deliriously happy. We're calling her Suzette. The 21st, 1940. Yesterday, Michelle's aunt died. He will inherit a great deal of money. At last, he has the chance to become the research scientist he has always longed to be. Soon, Suzette will be four years old. It's, it's almost incredible. How happy we could be if it were not for these spells of jealousy that sweep over Michelle. They're, they're like a sickness. Nothing I say or do seems to convince him of the absurdity of his imaginings. I wonder, I wonder if they will always vanish as they have before or sometimes. Ah, good afternoon, Doctor. Bonjour, Chabon. The birthday cake ready? All ready, Doctor. And such a cake, the whites of 24 eggs. Oh, such a surprise for the little one. For my wife, too. She thinks I've forgotten all about Suzette's <laughs> birthday. Oh, Doctor. Is that not Madame Toussaint crossing the street? My wife? How could it be? She's home with... What? Oh, yes, it is. I'll put the cake in the box, Doctor. Oh, look, Madame Giraud. She's going there again. No, I can't believe it. In broad daylight. Chabot! Coming, coming. At least three times a week I see her go to that man's house and to think she's married. Who did you say her husband... Well, monsieur? I... I beg your pardon. Do you always listen in on people's conversation? Excuse me, excuse me. Dr. Toussaint, the cake, the birthday cake. With a roof made of sugar cookies. 
But one day, a big storm came and blew the roof off, and... Oh, Dr. Tuzak? Yes? Daddy, Daddy. Hello, darling. Happy birthday. I'm going to have a birthday party, Daddy. Lots of children are coming. In yeah. an hour. Yes, darling. Anna, madame is out. Well, just for a little while, she said. Well, I'm sure she did not expect you home so early. Anna is telling me a story. Each time, Anna has a different story. Each time? What do you mean? Oh, she only means... I that... didn't ask you. Suzette, do you see Anna often? Do you? Oh, yes, Daddy. Every afternoon when Mommy is gone, Anna comes from next door and tells me, Daddy, my hand, you're hurting my hand. Oh, darling, darling. I wouldn't hurt you for anything in the world. I'll be in the study. Michelle? Michelle? Oh, darling, aren't you coming inside? I told you before. I, uh, I'm busy. But, Michelle, you aren't busy. Oh, darling, your beautiful cake just came. Chabon brought it himself. He said you were there before, but you... Yes, I was there. And I heard all about your afternoon excursion. Not only did I hear it, I saw you go there with my own eyes. Oh, Michelle, I can explain all that. Darling, we, we have company. When we're alone, I'll talk... What makes you think I'll ever be alone again? Michelle, our guest. What of it? Everyone knows. Everyone but your husband. You even paid Anna to watch our child so you can go to him. Oh, my poor Michelle. Why must you bother to lie to me? I told you, everyone knows. Please, think of Suzette. Did you think of Suzette? Did you? You're not fit to be her mother. You're nothing but a... Now will you listen to me? Your guest. Perhaps... You had better go to your guests. That night, when, I don't know, Michelle left our home forever. He did not go alone. I am taking Suzette with me in the hope she will soon forget you. Take what you wish and never try to see us again. Act two of This Love of Ours, starring Rita Hayworth and Charles Corbin, will continue in a moment. What are you doing with that big tray, Libby? A balancing act? Well, if Deanna Durbin learned how to carry a tray full of dishes, I can too. What did she do that for? Why, she's a stage-struck waitress in her new picture because of him. She wanted to do the job right, so she learned the art from a waitress in the Universal Commissary. You know, Libby, washing dishes can be just as much an art as carrying them. And it's an art to keep hands lovely in spite of dishwashing. But easy with Lux, because Lux is so kind to hands. They can stay lovely as a leading lady. You know, in Deanna's new picture, Because of Him, Charles Lawton gets her a part as a leading lady in a play. Well, whether a girl is an actress or a leading lady at home, she needn't have dishpan hands. In fact, she can get rid of them by changing from strong soaps to Lux for dishes. Lots of women prove that by actual tests. And another thing, Lux is thrifty. Why, tests show that ounce for ounce, it washes up to twice as many dishes as any of ten other leading soaps. That's important these days when soap is scarce. Lux goes so much further, it's worth waiting for. If you couldn't get Lux today, try again soon. Here's your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Act two of This Love of Ours, starring Rita Hayworth as Karen and Charles Corbin as Michel Tuzak. More than an hour has passed since Michel Tuzak closed the pages of Karen's diary. And for more than an hour, he has sat at her bedside, as still and unstirring as the girl he has dragged back from oblivion. He looks up now as Dr. Barnes comes in. How is she? Resting comfortably, I think. You wouldn't care to tell me anything more about her? Not now, please. But if she's your wife... Surely when, you. when she's out of danger, is there some place we could move her? A private sanitary, somewhere in the country. There's Rossmore Sanitarium in Wisconsin. It's a very fine place to recuperate. Thank you. Let me know when you're ready, and I'll make the arrangements. <laughs>
Rathmore Sanitarium. Karen Hunter, please. Mr. Targell calling. Oh, yes, Mr. Targell. Miss Hunter is out walking, but she left a message. Yes? She's leaving the sanitarium tomorrow. If you can call for her, she'll be ready about noon, cottage number three. I see, thank you. Tell her, please, that I'll be there. I can't get over it, Karen. How wonderful you look. It must be the air up here. Well, I've had enough of it. I simply can't wait to get away. Can I put these bags in my car? Mm -hmm, please. I'll be with you in a minute. Well, take your time. Our girl. Good morning, Doctor. May I congratulate you on your patient's very evident recovery? Oh, um, I'm taking her back to Chicago. I see. You know she's my wife. Uh, yes. I assume she's made up her mind about what she wants to do. As far as I'm concerned, it's entirely her own business. Where is Karen? In the cottage. But I'm afraid you'll be wasting your time. I suppose I should have told you I intended leaving today. You might have mentioned it. Karen, I must talk to you. Is your conscience troubling you, Michelle? It needn't. You owe me nothing. There are many things I want to talk to you about. I wanted to wait until you were quite well again. Karen, for years, I tried everywhere to find you. What do you want me to do? Feel sorry? Stop worrying about me. I'm going with Targell. I know what I have to face. I've lived from day to day for a number of years now. You're coming back with me. Sorry, it's too late. It's not for my sake. It's for Suzette. Suzette? Ever since I saw you in Chicago, I, I've been waiting for you to mention her name. I'd say to myself, now, now he'll tell me about Suzette. Don't you want me to speak of her? Oh, of course I do. How is she? Does she ever ask about me? That first day I took her away. She wanted to know where you were. I told her you were ill, that you were going away too. I told her you would never come back. She started to cry. She, she said, then you must be dead. I let her believe that. I let her believe you were dead. Oh, how could you? How could you? At the time, it seemed best. She was too young to understand anything else. But she isn't too young now. Why haven't you told her the truth? If you couldn't make me live for Suzette, why did you bring me back to life at all? Michelle, I will go back with you. And I'll do my utmost to take her away from you. And then you'll know what it means to be alone. Do you still want to take me? Yes. Joseph? Yes? Joseph, I brought you here for nothing. I'm... I'm going back with him. Well, I uh, suppose you know what you're doing. I want my child. It won't work, my dear. It won't work. Well, the news has created quite a stir at home. How do you know? The conductor just gave me this telegram. It's from the housekeeper, Miss Tucker. They're all delighted. And, and Suzette? She didn't mention anyone in particular. You, uh... You have quite a staff, what with the house and the laboratory. You've come a long way since Paris. Karin, please let me tell you what happened. Why won't you let me explain? There's nothing you can explain. It's finished. Have you decided what we're going to tell Suzette? What we will tell is the truth. We're married. I never tried to get a divorce, and neither did you. We'll tell her that we knew each other for a long time. We met again, and decided to get married. She'll be a little shy at first. You must expect that. Yes. But when she's older and can understand, we can tell her everything. You say that so confidently. But you will never tell us. Never. Because you're afraid. <laughs> Oh, 
welcome home, Doctor. And Mrs. Tuzak. Oh, I was never more surprised and delighted in my life. Thank you, Miss Tucker. Well, shall we go inside first or walk over to the laboratory? Isn't uh, Suzette home? She's just in the garden. Suzette? Suzette. Suzette. Uh-huh. There she comes. Daddy, Daddy. Hello, darling. Suzette. Oh, she, she's so grown up. She's such a sweet child, Mrs. Tuzak. Look at the flowers, Daddy. I bought them for you. Oh, very nice. But you should give them to someone who wants to meet you very much. Oh, here. Hello, Suzette. How do you do? Oh, you'll have to say more than that, or Karen will think I've brought you up very badly. I'm sorry. I'm very glad you're here, and I hope you'll be very happy. Oh, Daddy, Daddy. Suzette, come back. Suzette. So here you are, young lady. I... I'm unpacking Daddy's clothes. You've been acting like a little baby. Well, there's nothing unnatural about your father getting married again. She seems like a very nice person. Please, Tucky, don't scold me. All right. I won't scold you. He looked at me as if he's afraid. And the way he looked at her. He never looked that way at you or anybody. Well, of course not. Your father's not in love with me. Does, does he love her as, as much as he loves me? It's different, dear. Well, it's like that left shoe and that right shoe. They're both shoes, but they're different. But why does he... Now you put the rest of his clothes away and then come downstairs, hmm? I'll see you about dinner. Look, this newspaper. Why would Daddy keep an old newspaper in his suitcase when... Oh. What about an old newspaper, hmm? Oh, nothing, nothing. Cafe entertainer shoots self. Cafe entertainer? It's her. And her picture. It's her. <laughs> No dessert for you, Suzette? No, thank you, Mrs. Daddy, what do I call your wife? Why, I don't know. You're too young to call her Karen, and stepmother is a little awkward. Suppose you just call her mother, if she doesn't mind. I won't call her mother. I couldn't. Well, why don't you just call me Karen? Perhaps that won't be too bad. Karen would do very well. You wanted me to call her mother. Mrs. Tuzak is too young to be called mother by a grown-up girl like you. I'm not grown-up, and she's not my mother, and she doesn't belong here. She can't take my mother's place, even if you did marry her. Go to your room at once. Oh, please. Suzette. All right, all right, I'll go to your room. Oh, if you don't mind, Doctor, I'd better go with her. I'm sorry, Karen. She hates me so much. She hates me so much. You play beautifully, Mrs. Suzette. We were talking about Suzette. Yes. You can't worry about her like this. She's hardly spoken a word for two days. Dr. Tuzak will know how to handle her. He's tucking her in bed now. I can tuck her in bed, yes. But it appears that's all I can do with her. She's still the same? Yes. We must be patient with her. You see, Mrs. Tuzak... She's lived here so long with only her father and me that your coming made it seem so different to her. Her mother's quite real to Suzette. She worships her like a saint. She used to carry on long conversations with her. I got her out of that, oh, but there now... there's something I could do. Yes, I believe there is. What? You see, she has me for a refuge to comfort her and watch over her. I think it's better that I leave. Miss Stark. Oh, no, please. You love her, too. Well, she wouldn't... We wouldn't want you to go. Uh, I'm older, Mrs. Tuzak. I've had a lot of experience with these little savages. In time, when I'm gone, she'll come to you with her troubles. And that's bound to bring you closer together. I think you're right. I know I am. And later, when things are better, you should want me back. Oh, right? we will, of course. I'll leave early in the morning before she's awake. But not tomorrow. It's Suzette's birthday tomorrow. It's for the best. A child can have only one woman to mother her. And you, Mrs. Tuzak, are the one to do that. Well, I think I'll do a little packing. Uh, Miss Tucker, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Suzette. 
Happy birthday. Breakfast is all ready. Thank you. Where's my father? In the laboratory. He and Dr. Andrews are very busy. You see, they want to take the afternoon off for your party. Did you tell Miss Tucker to go away? No, darling, I didn't. Then who made her go? Not my father. No one made her go, dear. She didn't go because she wanted to. Why would she leave without even saying goodbye? Well, perhaps she thought it was best that way. Come here, dear. Let me help you with your hair. You know, when I was a little girl, my mother used to curl my hair around her finger and, and then draw it out just like this. Do you have to do my hair? No. No, I just thought you might like me to. Where are you going? Eat your breakfast. I'll be back later. You're going to tell my father. You're going to tell him I've been bad again. No one's bad around here, Suzette. A little unkind, maybe. Not bad. I've talked to Suzette a dozen times. The only success we've had seems to be in upsetting each other. Now she blames me for sending Miss Tucker away. She doesn't mean to be cruel. She's What's just... that, Michelle? Back of the garden there? Oh, just something she fixed up with the help of the old gardener. But what is it? It's a shrine. She begged me to let her have a shrine to her mother. A, a shrine to me? I didn't approve, but... I thought anything that would make her happier... Well, it's a little ironic, isn't it, to look at one's own shrine? To be canonized in a child's mind? For what? For years of waiting and longing and dreaming about a child who won't even stay in the same room with me. <laughs> it's almost funny, isn't it? Karen, Karen. <laughs> oh, you wouldn't understand. You've never been immortalized in stained glass, have you? Have you? Suzette, I've been looking all over for you. What are you doing? Nothing. Just sitting here in the garden. Did you like your birthday present? Oh, yes, Daddy. Thank you very much. You know, you haven't been much like my little girl since I've come back. Oh, Daddy. Oh, I know, dear. You were unhappy. I hope you'll believe me when I tell you that I'm unhappy, too. And so is Karin. But imagine things would be a lot different than they are. We'd hope that we'd all be happier here than we'd ever remembered being. And we are not. What you are doing is wrong, darling. And yet I, I know you think it's right. Karin only wants to love you. Daddy, don't say any more. I'm going to tell you a little story about her. Then you'll know her better. I know about her already. You know what? What was in the newspaper. There was a newspaper in your suitcase. It said she was an entertainer in a nightclub. Suzette. And that she tried to kill herself. Oh, I'm sorry you saw that. But don't you see that... And I'm sorry she's unhappy. But that doesn't give her any right to try to be my mother. Daddy, couldn't we get our bicycles and have lunch in town? Just you and I. Why don't we have lunch here? Because we might disturb them. Disturb whom? Our friends come to visit Karen. He must be a very good friend the way she welcomed him. Mm, a very good friend. Well... Then we must go in, too, and meet him. He's a funny man. He wanted to draw my picture right away. I think you'd like that. Come on, let's say hello to him. Yes, the house is beautiful, the grounds are beautiful. And I came to see you, Karen. Tell me, has anyone told Suzette that she's your daughter? No, we haven't been able to yet, mm. but... Isn't working out, is it? Well, things haven't gone perfectly, no. But how could they? It takes time. Now, what about you? You wrote me you had a new accompanist. One, I've had three. They all played the piano, they all smiled brightly at the audience, but there isn't a spark of life in their performances, or in mine. So, a week ago, I walked out. You see, I miss you, Karen. Joseph. Karen, you don't belong here, and you know it. You have no right to say I'm that. I'm not interested in my right to say it. It's the truth. All you've had is heartaches. I could have told you that, but I wanted you to find out for yourself. And I've come to take you back. Oh, I... I just don't know. I don't know what I should do. Hello, Targo. Oh, hello, Doctor. Well, how about you, young lady? May I draw your picture now? Yes, if you'd like. Oh, I would. <laughs> now, if you'll just sit still for one moment, here's my paper and pencil. Now, this, uh, this really needs a Gainsborough. But since I'm not a Gainsborough, I'm not going to even try to capture the zest of youth, the fire and dignity of those young eyes, nor the beauty of that brow, not even that saucy little chin. No, Suzette, I'm, I'm not going to make you beautiful at all. I'm going to make you 
funny. Funny? Yes, my dear. Because one day you'll realize that life is funny and people are funnier. Now, one more line, and we're finished. With the compliments of your humble servant. Oh. Disappointed? Do I really look like this, Daddy? Yes, this is how Mr. Targell sees you. Let me look again. <laughs> Can you do one of my daddy? Only with the subject's permission. Please let him, Daddy. Well, after lunch, perhaps. But Corky, you wouldn't have to have Corky's permission, Mr. Targell. Who's Corky? My dog. Please, Mr. Targell, he's right outside. Why, him. by all means, we must do your dog. You know, Suzette, I once had a dog. You know Did me. you hear, Michelle? She laughed. Yes, I heard. I... I want to tell you, I didn't ask Joseph to come here. I, I didn't know he was coming. I'm glad he came. I don't expect you to cut yourself off completely from your friends. Oh, listen. She seems to have taken to him. Oh, it's wonderful to see her happy. It's the first time I've heard her laugh since... since I came here. I don't know. I think she has some... some scheme, maybe she's... I don't care what scheme she has. For the first time, she seems happy, and that's enough for me. I won't have her continually hurting you. To see her like this is worth anything. Michelle, Joseph wants me to go back to Chicago. I've made up my mind. I'm going. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. WABC, New York. Here is a news bulletin. A Labor Department spokesman says the federal government will probably seize New York's tugboat sometime tomorrow. This bulletin has come to you from CBS News. In a moment, our stars, Rita Hayworth and Charles Corbin, will return in Act Three of This Love of Ours. Tonight, we have as our guest a young lady responsible for many of those colorful, imaginative costumes that have dazzled moviegoers over the years. She is Miss Helen Rose, a designer at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios. I've noticed, Helen, that you specialize in musical production. Yes. Any kind of clothes designing fascinates me. But in musicals, you have more chance to use imagination and originality. And you use plenty of it in the Harvey Girls. I'm sure those waitresses of the 90s would have loved the costumes you created for the picture. They might have had more trouble than I did keeping them fresh. Uh, how's that? They didn't have luck. I did. I was hoping you'd say that. Of course, Judy Garland and John Hodiak do a fine piece of acting. But those wonderful girls' costumes, well, they're remembered by everyone I know who has seen the picture. I don't suppose most people realize what a problem it is keeping costumes looking fresh. When you're shooting in Technicolor, everything has to be perfect. The Harvey girls were famous for being immaculate, so we washed those uniforms after every shooting. Mr. Kennedy will be interested in that, I'm sure. I imagine that Lux Flakes helped you out, Miss Rose. Indeed, they did, Mr. Kennedy. We had to play safe with colors and delicate lingerie fabrics, so we used Lux for everything washable that was worn in the picture. The finished picture certainly proves what a wise choice that was. Those costumes looked lovely every minute on the screen. Thank you. I was really proud of them, too. Thank you, Miss Rose. Lots of women take pride in keeping their own lingerie lovely the luxe way. Actual washing tests prove that strong soap, hot water, and rough handling make colors look faded and drab far too soon. Slips and nighties washed the luxe way stayed lovely three times as long. Lux care is thrifty care. That's especially important now when under things are hard to buy. Use enough Lux to get rich suds, but no more than you need. A little Lux goes a long way. Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. We hope you'll join us after the final curtain for a brief chat with tonight's stars. Here's the third act of This Love of Ours, starring Rita Hayworth as Karen and Charles Corvin as Michel. A few hours have passed, and in the Tuzak home, a score of shouting children celebrate Suzette's birthday quite unaware that Suzette herself has slipped quietly away and is now walking aimlessly outside the house, apparently waiting for someone. Suzette? Oh, yes, Daddy? Why aren't you inside, dear? Is something wrong? Oh, no, it's a lovely party. I'm... I'm waiting for Uncle Paul. Oh, well, so am I. 
Daddy, are you sure he's coming? He'll be here. I telephoned him early this morning. But why is he late? Uncle Paul always comes to my birthday, and he's never late. Suzette, did you... Did you ever mention Paul to Karen? Karen? Does Karen know Uncle Paul? She did, many years ago. I don't think she'd remember him anymore. I would like them to meet again. Daddy, Mr. Targell promised to draw a picture for me of my mother. I... I asked him to... Is that all right? Why, yes, of course, dear. Your young friends in there are keeping him very busy, though. I can tell him just what she looked like. I think he knows. How would Mr. Targell know? Because he's an artist. And artists have great imagination. Now, come, it's time to cut the birthday cake. And don't worry, Uncle Paul will be alone. No, no more pictures now for ten minutes. Now, listen, you Indians, there's a birthday cake. You don't want to miss that, do you? Joseph. <laughs> I certainly let myself in for something, didn't I? When are you leaving? Oh, as soon as this is over. Have you uh, made up your mind, Karen? Yes. If your office still holds. I've told Michael, uh, Michelle, I'm going with you. And he's going to let you? Well, there's not much he, he could do about it, is there? No, my dear. Not much. Darling, look who's here. Uncle Paul, Uncle Paul. Hello, darling. Happy birthday. I knew you wouldn't forget, but you're so late. Well, now, how could I forget my best girl's birthday? Here, with my very best wishes. A present. Oh, thank you. Well, open it. Open it. A bracelet. Oh, it's beautiful. Look, everybody, look. He gave it to me, my <laughs> Uncle Paul. And now he's going to play the piano for us, aren't you, Uncle Paul? Darling, give the men a chance to sit down. At least a chance to meet everyone. Well, Michelle, aren't you going to introduce me? Where is she, this new wife of yours? She, she went upstairs to her room. If you'll excuse me, I'll bring her right down. How do you do? Paul. <laughs> well, yes. Michelle. Where is Michelle? I don't know. After he came downstairs, he told me to wait for you here, alone. And you... You don't know me. Oh, this is most embarrassing. I can't remember ever... Karen. You're Karen. Paul. Paul, your eyes. You can see. Yes, yes, but I should have known you immediately. I... I can't believe it. Didn't you know? Michelle didn't say anything about me? No, no, nothing. Not even that he knew you. Knew me? Why, Michelle has been my best friend for years. What? Tell me what happened. What happened? Well, you remember the day in Paris when you came to see me. You couldn't stay long. It was Suzette's birthday that day, too. Oh, do I remember? All these years I've been trying to forget. It happened about a week after that. I was playing the piano. I heard the doorbell ring. I thought my housekeeper would answer, so I just kept on playing. <laughs> you know how much I wanted to be a good student. I'm Dr. Tuzak. Does that mean anything to you? Why, yes, of course. You're Karen's husband. Won't you... Where uh... is my wife? I'm sorry, Dr. Tuzak. I don't know. Where is my wife? Tell me or I'll kill you. I'll kill Are you. you. crazy? Let go of me. Let go of me. Where is she? Help someone. Help. 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 Oh, let him go. Let him go. He can't protect himself. He's blind. He's blind. Blind? Oh, stop it. Stop it. Are you... Are you all right? I'm... Don't worry about me. I must be out of my mind. I made a horrible mistake. Please, let me help you. It's nothing. Dr. Tuzak, why isn't Karen coming anymore? What's happened? She went away. Disappeared. I thought you'd know. She used to come here three afternoons a week. She taught me how to play the piano. A good teacher. And very kind. Why don't you say something? Dr. Tusak? Dr. Tusak? He is gone, monsieur. For years, he kept looking for you, Karen. And all the while, as if I were his brother, he took care of me. He even brought me to America, to a specialist. They operated, and now I can see again. Yes, I found happiness, Karen. But Michel, all he could do was to keep looking for you. Oh, he tried to tell me, Paul, and I wouldn't listen. I wouldn't listen. But it's not too late. He's found you. You have him now. And Suzette. Suzette. Oh, it is too late. Children have all gone home, Mr. 
Tardell. You haven't forgotten. Forgotten? You said when they left, you'd draw a picture for me of my mother. No, I haven't forgotten. Here's your crayon and your big pad. Well, go ahead. Now, what was she like? Tell me. Daddy. Tell him, dear. My mother was very beautiful, wasn't she, Daddy? And there wasn't another lady like her in the whole world. My daddy's told me that a thousand times. This is not helping, Mr. Targell, dear. It may be. Please go on, Suzette. Her hair was curly like mine, wasn't it? Yes. And her eyes were dark and large, and she smiled whenever she looked at me. My father told me everything about her. And he told me over and over again that he'd never marry anyone else because he couldn't love anyone else like he loved my mother. And did he tell you about Paris? When you were a little baby? Curry. And the chestnut trees. And the funny old baker around the corner. Oh, Daddy, you didn't tell her all about Mother, too. You didn't, did you? No, I didn't. You have to be quiet, Suzette, if I'm to finish your mother's picture. I don't want it now. It's spoiled. She spoiled it. She spoils everything. I'm going away, Suzette. Why did you come here? Daddy and I were so happy before you came. Curry, you can't go. Paul. Paul has told me. Then you know. And you must stay. No, Michelle, no. It just won't work. Daddy, you mustn't kiss her. You mustn't. Oh, she said. Let her go. Joseph was the first to tell me it wouldn't work. I have been times before, Karen, when I've been wrong. But not this time. Yes, Michelle, now I know. I know that you have loved me. That you did try to find me. That you... Oh, darling, why didn't we find each other sooner? Karen. Please. No, no, no. Don't say anything. I'm not unhappy. There's just one thing I want you to know, too. I did love you. I'll always love you. Michelle, Karen, Suzette's leaving. Oh. She says she's going to Miss Tucker if I don't take her with me. Now, you'd better do something about it and do it quick. Tell her the truth and tell her now. You think we haven't done everything? How would you do it? I'm going to do what you should have done a long time ago. Go out in the garden and tear down that fake memorial. Suzette. What? Come here. I'll come, Daddy, but I'm going away. And if Uncle Paul won't take me, I'll go myself. I'll run away. There'll be no need for that, dear. I, I told you I was leaving, and I am. Would you... Would you mind if I put my arms around you just... Just once before I go? No. You see, I used to have a little girl of my own a long, long time ago, and then I... I lost her. You mustn't blame me altogether for having wanted you to love me just as I would have wanted her to love me. Where... Where is she now? Not far away, Suzette. She's... She's quite close to me now. Try not to hate me when you think of me. Even though you couldn't love me as I... as I wanted you to. Suzette? You... You finished the picture of my mother? Yes, my dear. Yeah. Thank you. But that's... It's her. It's Karen. Karen is my... Yes. Daddy, where is she? Karen! She's going away. Yes, darling. I'm ready, Joseph. Please, I want to talk to you. Daddy, stop her! Stop her! Only you can do that, Suzette. But you knew. You knew all the time and you wouldn't tell me. Some things, little one, cannot be told with words. Some things only the heart can know. But I do know. I do know now. Mother. Oh, my darling. Mother. My mother. Our stars will return for their curtain calls in just a moment. Sally, do my old eyes deceive me? Or are those nylons you're wearing? Why, yes, they are. Well, then why aren't you battered and bruised? They tell me there are near riots whenever nylons go on sale. Oh, I've had these since before the war. But they look wonderful. Well, of course, I've always luxed them. Lots of girls have kept their pre-war nylons going that way. Now, there's Mrs. Linky of New York. She wrote us, I'm still wearing pre-war nylons. In August 1941, I was lucky enough to buy some, and I've just lived in them. Well, in fact, I've worn most of them ever since, and I still have some left. Now, some people say that I'm just plain lucky, but I say no, I've always used Lux. And I do give a lot of credit to Lux. 
My nylons are luxed after every wearing in lukewarm suds. Believe me, when I get new nylons, I'll use Lux, too. It certainly helps to keep runs away. Facts back up Mrs. Linky's story, Sally. A famous laboratory made a series of strain tests on rayon, silk, and Lyle stockings. Proved that Lux cuts down runs over 50%. Then they tested nylon the same way and got amazing results, too. Identical stockings washed with a strong soap or rubbed with a cake soap pop runs quickly. So you see, you can get ever so much longer wear from stockings if you Lux them. You can be sure I'll keep on using Lux for rayons as well as for my new nylons. We return you now to William Keeley. Our spotlight turns on tonight's stars, Rita Hayworth and Charles Corbin, who return for their curtain calls and give us the chance to say how much we enjoyed their excellent performances. Well, Bill, you gave us a great supporting cast to work with. Especially little Sue England, who was with us in the picture. That reminds me of something I've wanted to say for some time. How much we appreciate the supporting casts who work with us on Lux from week to week. I know what you mean. They don't get any billing, but they do a faithful and superb job. Your supporting casts on Lux include some pretty famous names in pictures, don't they, Bill? Yes, indeed. Leading men like Francis X. Bushman and Norman Field and Herb Rawlinson, who are in our cast tonight, by the way. They were all great stars in their day, and they're continuing that standard of fine acting in this theater. And don't I recognize from time to time such famous radio personalities as Eddie Marr, Tudor Marson, Joseph Kearns, and Verna Felton? And not to mention Charlie Seal, who used to play with me years ago in repertoire. Well, Bill, probably no one outside the theater knows how important the supporting cast really is. Agreed. Charles, we're all of us looking forward to your next appearance on the screen. Thanks very much, Bill. I'm starting another picture soon with Mel Oberon. I was over at Columbia the other day, Rita... And your boss, Harry Cohen, showed me your latest picture, Gilda. Confidentially, Bill. How was she? Well, if Rita weren't here, I could tell you she gives one of the finest performances you've ever seen on the screen. And Columbia Pictures can be justly proud of her. Uh, thanks, Bill. I'm sorry I wasn't here to hear you say that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have on Lux next Monday night, Bill? Next Monday night is another red-letter date for us because we're presenting one of the screen's most moving stories of devotion, love, and sacrifice with two of the finest stars we've ever brought together on this stage. It's Warner Brothers' great dramatic hit, Now Voyager, starring Betty Davis and Gregory Peck. I can see that your... Uh, I can see that your audience agrees you've got a great treat for next Monday, Bill. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Good night, and our thanks to both of you. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater brings you Betty Davis and Gregory Peck in Now Voyager. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Perhaps you can't get Lux Flakes every time you ask. That's because there's still a shortage of fats and oils especially the fine oils needed for fine soaps. Your government asks you to keep right on saving every drop of used fat in your kitchen. This releases oils for soap. Help put more soap on your grocery shelf by saving used fats regularly and turning them into your dealer promptly. He'll give you four cents for every pound. In a final report issued by the War Activities Committee, motion pictures, along with radio and the press, were given full credit for their share in the light victory and final peace. The report says in part... A well-informed public aided in our ultimate victory, and the screen, the press, and the radio proved themselves vital mediums of public service during the wartime years. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Now Voyager with Betty Davis and Gregory Peck. The Spry Treat of the Week. Spry Star Spangled Whipped Cream Pie. Velvety vanilla cream filling bright with cherries spangled with stars in a tender, flaky Spry pastry shell. For recipe, clip Spry ad in leading February women's magazines. For prize-winning results, rely on pure all-vegetable Spry shortening. Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Now Voyager with Betty Davis and Gregory Peck. And why not tune in a half hour early to hear Joan Davis over most of these stations? 
This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>